week. We're glad that you have joined us this morning. Uh, it's going to be a good, exciting time in the Lord. Let's pray over our service today. Father, in Jesus' name, God, you're so good to us, so merciful, so gracious. We just ask Holy Spirit right now to be our teacher. Set our hearts aflame. May we lift up our voices in praise and worship to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we go into this time of worship, Pastor Matt's going to lead us to the praise team. If you feel led, stand and worship. You want to raise your hands and worship, come and kneel at the altar, however the Lord leads you this morning. Let's worship together. Oh, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood.
There is wonder working power, Holy Spirit power, great redeeming power, power in the name, resurrection power, bondage breaking power, power in the name of Jesus. Trust in chariots. Oh, but I, yes, I'm going to trust in the name of the Lord. Some may trust in riches. Some may trust in all they own. Oh, but I, I will trust. In the name of the Lord, oh, there is wonder-working power, Holy Spirit power, a great redeeming power, power in the name. There is resurrection power, bondage-breaking power. trust in the name of the Lord. There is wonder working power, and Holy Spirit power, great redeeming power, power in the name of His resurrection power, bondage breaking power, power in the name of Jesus. I lift my eyes to the mountains, the mountains Above, oh, you are, yes, you are where my help is from. I lift my eyes to the anchor of heaven and earth. Lord, you are, yes, you are where my help is from. There is one new working power, Holy Spirit power, and great. Freedom. 
Our God is the only righteous judge. He's ruling over us with kindness and wisdom. And we will keep our eyes on you. We will keep our This is our God, the sacred refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable, with you forever we will reign, our God. Jealous for his own, none could comprehend his love and his mercy. Oh, our God is exalted on his throne, high above the heavens, forever he is worthy. Oh, and we will Exalted on his throne, 
High above the heavens, forever He is worthy. You can be seated. I'd like to invite the LHOP team to come up. We have a special LHOP presentation this morning. Miss Kaylee has her senior project and it is AS, uh, a, ASL, I get it mixed up, ASL, uh, sign language uh, is her passion. Uh, and this is a special um, presentation this morning. Normally with the Hands of Praise team, you get a lot of choreography and things like that, but this is literal sign language, exact sign language. So uh, please enjoy Waterfall by
Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. All right, I'm, I am going to have to turn my phone upside down because I'm getting notifications from my family. They're not here this morning. And uh, so uh, if for some reason I am still preaching, look, Dion's back there. Dion will do this for me. Dion, if I'm at 12.55, if I look like I'm still going, you need to do something like this and just say, land the plane, all right? All right? Land the plane. <laughs> See, now Dion's, he's like, I ain't about to do that. You go on. We'll be here to 1 o'clock. It'll be all right. All right. So anyway. Romans chapter 1, we're going to continue on this idea of faith, thinking about faith, doing the thing. See, I just asked the wrong person to signal me. I was just, anyway, there it was. Anyway, uh, Romans chapter 1, we're going to talk about faith. I'm going to point out three things in this. Uh, we're going to read the first 17 verses of Romans chapter 1, all right? Beginning in the first verse, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I might impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as in me, as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that the promise that you have given us, that it does not return void. That faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I pray and I ask, Holy Spirit, if you would be so merciful and so gracious to us this morning, that the eyes of our understanding would be opened, that we would, that the light of the glorious gospel would shine in, that your word would be illuminated in our hearts and we would be set aflame to obey it. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to talk about faith in this. And so we're going to talk about his personal faith and his public faith. So the first thing I want us to recognize is, is Paul speaking about his personal faith. In other words, his own personal relationship with Jesus. And so we, we, we see this here in the first seven verses. He says, Paul says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship. Look at this. Here's the, the first little idea. Obedience to the faith. So what we, what we see here is we see this obedience to the faith. This is the, the kind of the theme, if you will, through these first seven uh, verses here. So he says his personal faith. So he says, I'm a bondservant of Jesus. I've been separated to the gospel. I'm standing on the truth and solidified 
by the spirit of holiness. And we see all of these things. So the first one I want to talk about right there is that he says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And so I just want to take time out with this because, you know, this is a good place for, for me to just kind of lay some groundwork for some stuff that we see in the Bible. We see on Facebook uh, from time to time, you know, and I, I call it Facebook theology. It's like these one-liners that people put out there and, and, and do some things. And we, if we are not careful, we miss, if we're not careful, we miss the overall word that God's got for us. Like, so it says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus. And then, you know, you might say, well, I was just watching last week where somebody was proclaiming so much on, you know, that we were free in Christ. Am I free in Christ? Or I'm a bondservant to Jesus. What am I? And now where am I? Oh my goodness. I did not see that right there. It's good to see you. Good to see him. I'm so sorry, y'all. That was, I mean, it was just... Anyway, that made my day. Made my morning. Very much. All right, back to the sermon. Sorry. And not to bring attention. Sorry about that too. Bondservant of Jesus Christ. Look at this. Let's, let's, let's look at the Bible. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 6, all right? And let's just walk through a few of these things. Romans chapter 6. Watch what he says here. Romans chapter 6, verse 18. And having been set free from sin, having been set free from sin, I have become a slave of righteousness. So am I free or am I a slave? The answer, yes. Yes. I've been set free and yet I'm a bondservant. I'm enslaved to righteousness, yet I've been set free from sin. Here's another one. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Let me read that and watch this. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. Maybe. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Question, am I dead or am I alive? I am both. Because I've been crucified with Christ, right? I've been crucified with Christ, yet the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. So not only am I a slave and am I free, but I am dead and I am alive. 1 Corinthians, if you will. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. Listen to what Paul writes here. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. So wait a minute. Am I working or is God working? Yes, both. I am a slave and I'm free. I'm dead and yet I'm alive. I am laboring and yet God's grace is laboring. It's both. We're working together. Ephesians chapter 1. Watch this. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according, according to the good pleasure of His Wheel. And then look at verse 13. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Wait a minute. Did He before the foundation of the world choose me? Or did I on the day I trusted choose Him? Yes. Both of those. Both of those are truth. So what, I'm, what I want you to see here is don't let Facebook theology, don't let... This is why you need to read your Bible, read it all, put it together, have, understand who you are in Christ Jesus, and let the Bible teach you who you are. I'm a slave and I'm free. I am dead and yet I'm alive. I am laboring in the grace of God and the grace of God is laboring in me. I chose Him and He chose me. His personal faith. Calling, responsibility, bondservant of Jesus Christ. Look at this. Then he says, not only bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, but I'm separated to the gospel. Separated to the gospel. So when you and I give our lives to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and fills you and I, we, we are, we at that point have been separated out for the purpose of the gospel. Does that make sense? 
You and I, no longer do we get to live for ourselves. He's got a purpose for my life and for your life. And we are, we are separated and set out to the side for that. Separated to the gospel. Watch this. Concerning which he promised, verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So standing on the truth, all, all these promises that the prophets have been pinning down as we walk Paul's writing right here, he says, listen, all this Old Testament truth has been coming over and over and over and over again. These are the promises of God and these are what we are standing on. And then verse 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, solidified by the spirit of holiness through the resurrection. So to sum all that up, our, you and I, first and foremost, have a responsibility for our personal faith, our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Nobody can have your relationship for you, right? Nobody gets to stand, you know, I, I, you know, I, I hear people all the time saying, well, you know, I, I, I know too many Christians. I don't want to become a Christian because I know too many Christians. Or maybe somebody says something like, I don't want to go to church because there's too many hypocrites in church, you know, and, and all, all these different things. Here's what I say to that. More often than not, I make these statements. Right? I can, don't you allow anybody else's relationship with or their failure to have one cause you not to have a relationship. Your personal faith, your personal relationship is the number one thing that must happen prior to all anything else. It's yours. And this is the way it needs, just recognizing the fact that your personal faith, this is part of it, that you are a bond servant of Jesus. Jesus is the boss, you are not. All right? And the boss has separated you out for the gospel, for the good news. You have been purposely set apart. This is not for you to say, okay, many people think, you know, we, we want to talk about the, the gospel. And, and yes, our sins are forgiven and we are in relationship and we just act like that's the end of it. No, the fact that he saved us from our sins, the fact that he has put his spirit on the inside of us. Every bit of that is because you've been separated for this good news. And you get to stand upon the promises which we find in God's Word. We stand upon that and that gives us the strength. And then there's this solidifying of the spirit of holiness. In other words, he's going and he says, Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. And I would suggest that one of the things that you need to do about your own personal faith to strengthen it is to go back every once in a while and just remind yourself of who you once were and who you are today. Where, where are the victories been going on in your life? What's God been doing in your life? How have you been touched and changed by the power of God? Because we need to be reminded of those things from time to time. So our personal faith. And then he shifts gears and he goes, now let's talk about my, my public faith. There's two aspects to this public faith, but, faith, but let's look at verses uh, 8 through 13. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, so that you may be established, that is, that I might be encouraged together with you. Here's the word for this section, the mutual faith. So we're obedience to the faith in the first. Now we're talking about a mutual faith, both of you and me. And I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but I was hindered until now that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. So personal faith, that's, that's primary. What's secondary? Our public faith. And this is a calling, listen to this, a calling to the faith family. So what I, what I want to show us in this is I want to show mine and your responsibility to each other. All right? I mean, this is an assembly of believers. We are here together and we have some responsibilities to one another. And as we watch these right here, the first and foremost one, he says, Paul says, I'm making, I make mention of you always in my prayers. If I could get this one message this year, if this one thing I could begin to get you and I to, to do, and that is pray for one another. That you and I would take it serious. 
that you and I would not, that we would not, that we would not just be praying. I don't want to say quick prayers are not the problem. Uh, empty prayers are the problem. All right. You, you can pray a very powerful, a very powerful short prayer when you've been in relationship, you're walking with God. They don't have to be long and drawn out. But my point being is this. Let me, let me give you this, this thing. So I kind of did this at 8.30. I'll, I'll, I'll do it for us this morning, all right, in, in 11 o'clock. So here's, here's what I know. Here's how I know how fallible I am. So here's some confession, right? And, and you can just walk in this and you might. Anyway, let me say it like this. I know what we have a tendency to do, right? We have a tendency to leave church. We have a tendency to leave work. We have a tendency to leave any gathering where we are around other people. And you know what we have a tendency to do more often than not? We have a tendency to, to look at and see and have conversations about all the things that we didn't like about the individuals we are around. You ever notice how we do that? Right? I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's kind of, you know, it's just our sinful nature that we look at that. And, and, I, and I submit to you, I submit to you that the church, that the, the body of believers is as bad or maybe even more so worse than the lost. And here's one of the reasons why. Because we have been exposed to truth. We do know what the Word of God says about you and I and about how we are to be living. And so since we know this truth and when we see people not working, uh, walking in that truth, we have a tendency to see it. But our problem is, is that we see the, the specks in other people's eyes, but we can't see the plank in our own eye, right? And so as we as we're looking at the speck in everybody else's eyes, so I just, got a, I just had a, just a crazy thought. Can you imagine what would happen to the faith family, right? Us, if what we stopped doing was having conversations about people, especially brothers and sisters in Christ, that we saw their faults and we saw their sins. What if we began to pray for them every time we had a thought about how kind of sideways they were, or about how they needed to get, you know, they needed to get this together in their life, or they needed to get that together in life. What if we just begin to pray for them? What if we stopped talking about them at the lunch table or in the parking lot or on the phone or whatever, and we began to pray for them? And right? Y'all must not talk about people the way. I have a tendency to do. Am I, am I the only one here con confessing that sin? Are y'all leaving from here going, well, I'll tell you what, they need, the deacons need to be voting that joker out of here, man. He said right now, he talks about it. Y'all act like y'all don't. Here's the problem. The problem is I've had, I've had some conversations with some of y'all. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. I mean, here's the truth. Is that not the truth? Listen to me. I, Tell me that won't radically change who we are. Tell me it won't radically change that when you see a brother and a sister in Christ, that the truth is they might not be exactly right. They might not be walking the way that they once did. But instead of telling other people about how they used to look better, they used to walk better, they used to, they used to be this or be that, go to your prayer closet, get on your knees and begin to pray. Somehow, I don't, you know, I don't, even, I don't understand how it is completely that, that I'm a slave and yet free. I don't understand completely how I'm dead and yet alive. I don't understand completely how it is that I'm... I'm working and yet God's working. I don't understand completely how it's my choice and yet he chose me. I don't understand that. And I don't understand completely how it is that when I begin to pray for other folks, that God begins to do things in their life and begins to do things in mine. But I'm telling you, this is one of the great tragedies of the family of God is that we talk more about people than we do praying for people. And he would radically change who we are if we would stop. It kind of builds on this next thing. For I long to see you, verse 11, that I might impart to you some spiritual gift. Listen to that. He says, I, I want to be with you so that I can impart a spiritual gift to you so that you might be established. That you might be established. You understand what established means, right? You know, something that's had a long, long tenure, something that you don't have to worry about being so, so, so flippant. You know, 
I used in, in 830, I used the, the, the dot com bust. Like all, everybody was investing in all these businesses. Man, this is the thing, man. You know, dot com, dot com, investing in it. And then I, some of the folks were looking at me and I realized that I'm so old that some of y'all can't even remember the dot com bust. But anyway, but the truth is, that, but, but you know, they, they, people were investing in these companies. They weren't established, they went under. And yet, there were some folks at the same time, you know what they did? They invested in Coca Cola. And guess what? That money's still making in Coca-Cola, IBM, you know what I'm saying? In other words, there's some of these companies that they're establishing, they're working on. That same idea, God wants mine and your faith to be established. He says, and one of the ways that is that you and I become solid is that we, we together encourage each other. We build each other up. We're imparting to us where you're strong and I'm weak. You give your strength to my weakness. Where I'm strong and you're weak, I give my strength to your weakness. And we build each other up. Therefore, we are established as the body of Christ. Because it's, listen, some of us are hands, some of us are feet, some of us are eyes, some of us are mouths. And so we, it all worked together for the kingdom of God, for his purpose will be established. That is that we might be encouraged. What if we even went a step further on that whole prayer thing? All right? So what if, what if, now just think about it. So here we are, we're, we're, we're walking along, all right? We're walking along, we got, you know, we, we've got, uh, we're, we're just doing life together. We're seeing people, we're human. And so because of all those things, you know, some stuff we got good, some stuff we don't have good, right? All right. So some days you're doing good and I'm doing bad. And some days I'm, I'm doing good and you're doing bad. And so we're, we're encouraging each other. All right. Now follow with me. All right. So we see those things. We observe those things. So what if we just, all right, not only do we begin to pray for them. All right. We, not only do we begin to pray for them and pray for these individuals, but going beyond that, what if we began... At, to not only to pray for them in private, but we begin to encourage them in public, walking up to individuals. You, you with me? So think about how easy it is for you to sit around when they're not around and say what you see negatively. To start taking time out and speaking it in person publicly to their face. One on one, go along and say, man, I want you to know something. I, I see this in you. I see the grace of God in you. These are one of the things that I am encouraged by you. And we will build each other up in that. And I'm telling you, we will be strengthened on that. We will encourage each other. Imagine what would happen if, we're, if we are praying for one another and personally building one another up out in the hallway. In other words, man, stop somebody when you see them. You notice that God's been working in their life or you know something about them. And then you say, might say this, well, preacher, I don't really know them that well. Well, then that's a good opportunity for you to exercise the gift of hospitality and invite them out to dinner over to your house or you go out to eat with them so that you can get to know them. How about that one? That was free. Somebody says, I'm, I don't know anybody. We, you ain't had nobody over to eat. You ain't going out to eat with nobody. You can't get a cup of coffee with somebody. That's how you get to know people. I've been saying for years, you don't get to, eat, you know, we, you know, we hadn't been doing, uh, what do you call it, greeting time. I don't forgot what we called it. And we hadn't done that since this whole COVID thing came out. And we're you know, shaking hands, hugging necks, doing all those things. And, you know, if, if ever you said something about that, folks, man, no, listen, it's an opportunity to talk to each other. I, I know and I appreciate that. But the reality is nobody, get, nobody gets to know anybody on the, in these greeting times, standing in the parking lot. Listen, I've discovered Christians lie more during greeting time than they do any other time during the week. <laughs> You doing all right? Yeah, I'm doing good. You lied, lying, lying. Your, your life is coming apart. <laughs> it's the truth. Your life is coming apart, but you can't. But, but the other part about that is, is we high five each other. We leave out of here. And then, but see here, golly, I don't even know. Problem is, you probably know that because somebody told you their life was falling apart. You said something to them that morning. They said it was all right. Then you walked off. You went to lunch and told your spouse that, man, I don't know why they wouldn't be honest with me out there the, right there in the greeting time. Everything. I know their life's falling apart. You ain't prayed for them and you ain't encouraged them, but you did. You knew it was going sideways. I'm mean, just telling you, that's, that's the truth of the way it is. But we got to reverse this thing. We're going to walk with Jesus. We're going to change some things. Somebody's got to be the one to begin to do it. Be begin to build each other up. Begin to strengthen each other. Begin to stir one another up. 
You know, that's what he tells us. You know, we love to talk about people that won't go to church. The reason he tells us that we gather together is to stir one another up for love and good works. So this is a pep rally, right? We're, we're firing each other up. I know that makes some people uncomfortable when I call it a pep rally. But you get the idea, right? We're missionaries and disciples. We got to get, we got to get fired up and go out there and tackle this lost and dying world. All right, I got, I got to move on. Even I can tell. I don't have my watch going. I, I can tell. Not only is public faith is he calling to the faith family. So we've got this mutual faith. So we personal faith is mine and your personal obedience to the faith. Second part is our public faith, and we're being called to the faith family. That's mine and your mutual faith. This last part here is our calling. Listen to this, calling to the future faith family. The future faith family. We see in verse 17, the just shall live by faith. I'm calling this just of, the justifying faith. What, look at verses 14 through 17. I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. If you've got a... Your personal faith will supernaturally transfer into a public faith. And certainly the public faith, it, you know, as difficult as it is, it's, it's easier on you and I many times in the household of God to talk about Jesus, right? But that's not enough. It's not enough for the family of faith now, but there is a future family of faith. I'm not, so I'm saying I'm a debtor. He, he gives three I am's here. I'm a debtor. I am ready to preach. And I am not ashamed. Three I am's. Number one, I am a debtor both to Greeks and barbarians. My separation to the gospel, your calling, your separation to the gospel, the fact that you've given your life to Jesus Christ makes you a debtor. Here's what he, he says. I'm a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. All right. So here's my statement. This will be the one. This will be the thing that you'll remember. This will be the one you'll put on Facebook for me. All right. Here it is. I am a debtor, listen to what I'm telling you, by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fact that I've been born again and the fact that there's a lost and dying world out there and the fact that I, when I read this, I understand that I am a debtor both to Democrats and Republicans for the gospel. I am a debtor both to liberals and conservatives for the gospel. I am a debtor to Jehovah's Witness. I am a debtor to Mormons. I am a debtor to Muslims. I am, I am in debt to... Listen to this. I, I said this. My family, my wife, my wife knows what it's like to live in an abusive home. And do you understand? I can't stand. Listen to what I'm telling you. And I am... And me, before I knew Jesus... My statement's always been, I'd rather fight than eat. I'm telling you, I know what it's like. I have thrown fists a lot of times. I have whipped and been whipped. You hear what I'm telling you? I cannot stand. I cannot stand a man that puts his hand on women. Do you understand what I'm telling you? But listen to what I'm telling you. I am a debtor. I am a debtor to those individuals for the sake of the gospel. It's more important that they hear the message of the gospel than it is for me to get satisfaction in the flesh by laying hands on them. My wife and I have been foster parents for years, 17, 16, 17 years. I cannot tell you the number of times that we have pulled the shirt off some child and put them in a tub and they've got scars on their back from their abuse. And yet I know that it won't be long and I will get to be face to face with them. And do you hear what I'm telling you? By the grace of God, I am a debtor, not to my flesh, to tell them what I think about them, how I feel about them, or the fact that if I could get my hands on them, I am a debtor to the gospel of Jesus Christ because without that, they will die, they will go to hell, and, and it just might be, just might be, if they get born again, they'll break that cycle in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And so I'm using the Democrat Republican because it's on the scene. But I'm telling you right now, you put any blank you want to in that. I'm telling you right now, the calling on your life, you've been separated to the gospel. You are a debtor to these men and women and boys and girls that don't know Jesus. And it's time for the family of God to get serious about that. That might give me some emails. I'm telling you right now, I know what it means to put my flesh to death so that I can tell somebody about Jesus. I am ready to preach the gospel. As much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel. Do, we are... And I encourage you, I've got the lessons. I've been saying this from, you know, back in December, that we are, we're walking through these doctrinal lessons. I've got some, even if you're not in a small group that's doing them, you can get them from me. You can walk through these things. If you don't even know what I'm talking about, I've got like uh, 26, 36 lessons. They're about 12, 15 questions, a couple of pages. You can do it in a week or two, and you can walk through and get you a good, solid Bible understanding, good, solid doctrine. Many times people won't share their faith because they're afraid they're going to get some question that they can't answer. Can I tell you something? 20 plus years of preaching, master's degree in theology, I'm telling you right now, there are questions I cannot answer. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that there are questions that I cannot answer. In fact, if I, had a, if I, if I worshiped a God that I thought I could comprehend, I don't know, I'm not sure He'd be worth worshiping, Right? So here's the only thing that you need to know. As much as in you, don't, you can't wait for some kind of a, this great biblical understanding or that you've got some command of apologetics so you can work through every, you know, every question. Listen, when all you got to know is, have you been born again? This is the thing. Can you tell somebody that there was a time when you were blind, but now you can see? If you could do that, then as much as is in you, preach the gospel. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. And if that is so, if that is, uh, hey, here's a good question. If that's so far removed from you that you can't tell them what Jesus has done for you, then you need to go to your prayer closet this afternoon and say, Oh God, remind me again what it was like to be lost and be born again. For I am not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I would say to you, That if you're not taking the gospel serious, you need to ask yourself why. Is it because you're ashamed of it? Hey, it's it's only going to get, I personally believe it's only going to get more and more not in line with the culture. All right? But, but, But honestly... You just don't have to be ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because I understand it's the power. It's, it's the power. I would, not, I would not preach it. I wouldn't be a part. If I, if I didn't know because I've walked in relationship and the truth of God's word is done, I, I know that this is the power of salvation. I know that this is the answer. I am, I am walking living proof of what the, the, of that death, that burial, and that resurrection, that good news of Jesus Christ. I and, and we must just begin to get to a place where we begin. You say, preacher, I, I don't even know where to begin. You know, if, if you challenged me today to run a marathon, I don't believe today I would go out, right? I don't believe I'd go home and, and put, my, you know, put my boots on and try to run, what is it, 22 miles? What is, how far is it? What is a marathon? 26. 26. <laughs> Lord have mercy. I can't. Yeah, I don't even want to guess right. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't go out today and put my boots on and take off this afternoon trying to run out 26 miles, right? I mean, it's not what you do. But you got to start somewhere. And that's all I'm telling you, folks. Don't leave from here looking, looking and listening to what I'm saying and, and allowing God to speak to you and telling you you need to be doing more and Him give you a vision about the bigness of who God is and be afraid to begin. It just begins with one step. 
And so you just leave from here and say, God, I am going to walk with you. I'm not going to be ashamed. I'm going to tell other people. I'm going to come to church and be an encouragement and not a discouragement. God, I'm going to spend time with you because my personal relationship with you matters. And so I, I, I end with this. If you know you don't have a personal faith relationship with Jesus Christ, and I'm telling you, I pray that the Holy Spirit has begun to speak to you personally because you need to have that. You've got to have that. That is the number one thing beyond everything else is you having a personal relationship with Jesus. If you have a personal relationship with Jesus and you've allowed that thing to get so cold that it's been so long since you've really walked with a, a faith that's got fire in it, then today, both of those, repent. Tell God, I am sorry and I don't want to live like that anymore. God, I'm sorry that I have not put you as Lord of my life. I am sorry and I want you to do this work in me. And then if you're saying to yourself, I know that what you're saying is right, then just tell God, God, I am going to take a step to begin to share the gospel with people that have no relationship with you. I am just going to begin to do that one step at a time, one day at a time. Don't let the enemy paralyze you because of a good big vision that God gives you. Every big vision of God begins with one single step of obedient faith. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for how you're speaking to us. And I just ask you, be merciful. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for your grace. Even in these moments right now, Lord, we love you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. As Pastor Matt and the praise team leads us this morning, this altar's open. Come, kneel and pray right where you're at. Have a conversation with God. Don't leave from here. Don't leave from here hurting, wounded. Lay your life before Jesus this morning. Let's worship together. God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. O oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle, or else would we go, but with the Lord of It bows and all the mountains move into the sea. Oh Lord, you know the hearts of men, and still you let them live. Oh God, who makes the mountains melt, come bless us and
sure you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way, the mountains move into the sea, the nations rage, I know my God is in control. O oh Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, where else would we go but with the Lord of hosts? Thank you so much for your kind attention. So as we get ready to dismiss, let me make a, a, couple, of, uh, a couple of statements. Um, we are, as time goes on, the, we are, the, more and more of us are, are making it into the worship services, and we're excited about that, and we're, we're glad of that. Uh, we also are recognizing the, the, the reality uh, that we are having a whole lot more people that we know test positive and go into quarantine and end up in the hospital. So with that being said, we are, we are, doing, we are trying to do our due diligence uh, in making sure that we all stay healthy and that we're able to continue to meet together, all right? Uh, with that being said, uh, please uh, be, be helpful in this. And as we gather together and congregate when we dismiss from here, Let's try not to do it in the main hallways, the doors and whatnot, all right? Want to get off to the side, have a conversation, good. Uh, parking lot's good. Let's try not to gather out in the hallway. And let's, let's do what we can to keep everything nice and flowing. Does that make sense? Hey, if you're comfortable wearing a mask, wear a mask. Well, you know, we want you wear one. We're good to go. You know, hey, uh, wash your hands and all that other good stuff, all right? All right, I appreciate that very, very, very much. I mean, the last thing we want is an outbreak, all right? The last thing we want is to have some of our folks super close. We've watched some of us be in quarantine and go through the hospital stays, and we'd like to avoid that as best we can, all right? All right. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for your goodness, your kindness, and your mercy today. In Jesus' name, amen.